Yes, hello everyone, and it's another beautiful day. Um, so good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are across the world. And it's another day with um, on this series, Nation Building Series uh, with Femi Oyele. So wherever you're joining in from, uh, you can just say, you could say hello, you could say hi, and um, so good to have you here. So um, today we're going to be looking at something a bit different from um, the last two issues we've checked the other time, and uh, that's about political ideas what some people would call political philosophy. Um, we'll be looking at how ideas of our states, um, when I say states now, I mean countries as you have it today, um, how they are actually organized, how they evolved, um, ideas and perspectives about authorities um, in time past. When I say authorities, I mean people, philosophers, um, I mean scholars who have postulated ideas of how states really are supposed to be organized. Um, what are the processes of governance? What are the best forms of government? How should people interact with government? How should government interact with people? And to what end uh, should government strive um, to achieve? And that is the reason for this series uh, today. Uh, this, I mean, this particular edition. Because I found out actually that sometimes um, some foundational issues ought to be properly laid such that by the time we start discussing um, concepts, ideas, by the time we start discussing um, processes, um, how to do this, how to do that, they will, you, you will understand better because by that time you would have had a general knowledge of how states are organized, what are expected of you, even as a citizen and all that. So, without wasting time at all, um, so, well, so why? Why would we want to delve into this um, area of interest? Uh, one of the reasons is because so that it can provide us with better understanding of concepts. So when you hear words like democracy, we hear words like um, sovereignty, these words, yes, you could say they are English words, but they really do not mean um, the simple things that we've known them to mean. For example, some of us will just say, oh, democracy is just talking about the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And the fact that um, it's about uh, people participating, um, ensuring that the will of the majority is what prevail, ensuring that um, there is an egalitarian society, there is equality, there is a um, rule of law, and all that. Of course, those are some of the principles of democracy. But beyond that, and that's why I'm emphasizing that one of the beautiful things about this area we're looking at today is that it gives us a broader spectrum. It gives us a better understanding that when we talk about concepts like this, we could say citizenship, concepts like justice, like sovereignty, like equality, we'll have, there will be a basis for which we'll understand it beyond us, the surface. And that's why... Um, it's beautiful sometimes to delve into the area of political philosophy. Some of it you could say it's political ideas, whichever way. Okay, another reason why we should look at this area of interest is um, the fact that it provides ethical norms for the evaluation and reform of contemporary political structures. So you want to have an understanding of how we can evaluate our today's political structure. What um, okay federal system? Um, what best of what 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 form of government best suits a society like ours? For example, let's take Nigeria for example. You want to say that oh, because of the polarity, because of the plurality of interest, of ethnicity, of people, of culture. What kind of government? What system or what approach to governance would really is most is the most suitable for a country like Nigeria. So you have some basis, some ethical norms, some work some people have done in time past that you can use as basis for analysis. Thanks for joining Kafila um Sulaiman Olushesi Akibola Ronke. Thanks for joining. So so those are the basis for which uh we want to just look at. So then 
as um, MJC Val has noted in Type Five, says the problems of earlier centuries remain the problems of today, though dimensions and context have changed. You know, um, usually it's just like in, in, in a political way of saying there's nothing new under the sun. So the problems, for example, that we're facing today um, are problems that some societies or even us as a country have faced in time past. And that's the beautiful thing about knowledge. It is, yes, um, the context definitely would change. Um, the dimensions could change. But truth is that one way or the other, um, there's nothing at a level new under the sun in terms of the challenges society face, um, problem of ethnic schism, problem of terrorism, problems of um, economic crisis, problems of economic management of resources of a state, problems of leadership. All these problems are bound. So the beautiful thing, uh, what we're trying to now say is that there are perspectives that have been laid down. There are researches. There are works of people in time past that have been established as authorities. Thanks for joining Oludotu. Thanks for joining Gomez. Adibote Cousin, thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. So, um, so there are perspectives that people have dropped in time past that has been established as yardstick. In fact, some of them have evolved to become theories through which we can now analyze our reality as a state. And that's why we're looking at these areas of political ideas. And I'm going to be taking you through... I'm uh, sorry. I'm going to be taking you through... Uh, I'll be taking you through a, 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 a spectrum of strong political philosophers, how they have conceived um, a state to be. Of course, some of them, most of them really, um, the context of their own reality... Uh, dictated how they conceived a state to have been formed. For example, maybe you were, they, they were living at a time where there were issues, uh, where there were ethnic crises, where there was war, and they felt, okay, for example, Niccolo Machiavelli, that most of, many people usually quote today, that he says the end justifies the means. What necessitated that statement? What necessitated the Machiavellian approach to organizing of a state, organizing a state, what necessitated that mindset that, see, for a leader in any state, regardless of how you achieve your result, even if you need to go through fraud, if you need to murder people, if you need to do this and all that, just ensure that the safeguarding of the interest of the state is what is paramount. What created that kind of mindset for Niccolo Machiavelli. Those are some of the things we'll look at. So by the time we have uh, uh, situations like this, we'll begin to say, are we in this, is this the better approach to solving matters and all that? So I uh, will look at those spectrums. So I'm going to be analyzing six perspectives today. I, I would really love if you could stay, if you can stay with me through and pay attention to this part, because each of the perspective of some of these, what we call political philosophers, has depth, not just depth, has perspective, I, I'm sorry please, has, has principles through which we can say we want to run a state. Principles of governance, depending on our own peculiarity, Dep that means depending on where your, where your country is, depending on your own reality, depending on, so we'll just look at that. And without wasting time at all, I'd like to start with a philosopher that is very, I mean, I'm sure by the time I mention the name now, some of us have come across the name at one point or the other, either as a philosopher or as a literature specialist and all that. His name is Plato. So Plato lived between um, 427 BC and 347 BC. That is not the key thing now. But what is important is that by the time Plato was evolving his own idea of how a state should be organized, his own city-state, that is Athens, then was just defeated by Sparta in that popular Peloponnesia War. For those of us that um, are maybe acquainted with history a bit, um, his state had just been defeated. And then, uh, the, after some time, uh, the democracy that was running before was restored. And that same democracy, that, that's the government system that they were running then, that same democracy murdered Plato's teacher, the popular Socrates, on the allegation that Socrates was a wicked guy, he was teaching, um, he was brainwashing young people, he was giving them principles that was turning them against the state and all that. Of course, on an allegation like that, Socrates was murdered by the states. 
And Socrates was Plato's revered mentor. He was his teacher, he was everything to him, and all that unfortunately was killed. So the detest or the anger of Plato against democracy became more real. So he hated democracy and it was established in all his writings. Plato stated it clearly that the ideal state is one in which each individual does the job for which he or she is best suited. That's the, that how you excuse me, how you organize the state is not by giving, saying that the majority should determine the pace. Because sometimes the majority don't even know what they want. Sometimes the yardstick for the best form of leadership of governance is not majority. Because, for example, if you have 10 people in a room and you say that, oh, we only have uh, two options, nine people, or maybe seven, seven people believe that this is the way to go, the three people might be the might have the best or the better option of the two but of course because majority carries the day you go with the seven the, the opinion of the seven which might be limited based on their own orientation or exposure the three people might be very vast may know the bigger picture of the situation and all that so that was what plato was saying that uh, the ideal state is composed of, I mean, three classes of people. It says there are people you could call uh, the producers, the soldiers, and also the rulers. The producers are people who are dominated by instincts around economies, instincts around um, social activities, and all that. that. Those are not people that you put in charge of leadership. They are, uh, that those are people that you put in charge of welfareism of the state, how to organize the economies, how to ensure that the wealth of nation is distributed. I mean the process, not the people determining the course of the events. Now it says there are also the soldiers, the auxiliaries, people who have who have broader contests, who are strong, who, who believe, who can man up and take the responsibility of security of the state. So those ones could form the army, the soldiers, the, the police, and, and all the paramilitary and military. So those are the ones that defend the state against external aggression and ensure that law and order is being carried out as laid down by the law. And the third part is are the rulers. So for Plato, the rulers are not just rulers because um, they have some skills only, but that a deliberate inquiry is done to ensure that we know that these people have the capabilities in terms of their attitude, their disposition, and they are now aggregated and put into like a school. He said rulers are not people that you just uh, say because this, mm -mm, these guys will come together, be put into a communal living, a communal style of living. They, 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 not just that, there's, there's a specialized level of education that is provided for them because these ones have been identified to say, oh, they have this potential, they have this leadership skill, they pull them out, the state provides for them, they are not allowed to own private property. You could see Plato's perspective of state that see by the time they are allowed to own private properties now you will see that this one will buy one will just take the resources meant to do uh, maybe a road for a community and go and buy one house in uh, maybe another country in Europe or somewhere and then start doing this and all. No, part of the law is that you are not even allowed. It's not about declaring your assets now. It's about excuse me not being allowed to even own private properties at all and, and all that. That's part of the system. And then these guys are trained in areas of literature, music, military exercises, elementary uh, and advanced mathematics, philosophy, they are really trained. So that by the time they are talking, they are talking from wealth of knowledge, wealth of wisdom, exposure and all that. that these are the kind of people, they, they are trained even in paramilitary and civilian exercises. So they, they, they have basic understanding, beyond basic. They know what they are doing and they can really provide leadership because like I said, they are not going to now be serving for their own interest because, like I said, they are not even allowed to own private properties. He says when these guys have gotten to a, a, an age, a, a particular period, thank you so much for joining me, Atinuka Adebanjo, Aguru Alim, thank you, Arumbo Plateau. Um, good job, thanks so much, I really appreciate that. Uh, so, by the time all these people get to a point, they know that they have been groomed for this purpose. So that's why Plato came up with the concept that we know, philosopher king, that these ones, when they are ruling, they rule with authority. You don't question them. They determine the pace. So it's not a question of maybe you are trying to challenge their authority as it were. Of course, 
There may be a system of checks and balances, but Plato did not focus on that. Plato was emphasizing the need to have a philosopher king, people who have wealth of knowledge, people whose interest for private and personal interest has been over time pruned away because of the level of training, level of exposure, uh, level of um, uh, what, they, what, what they've gone through. So these ones are just trained to become focused on ensuring that the state gets its maximum value and impacts the people for good. And that's Plato's perspective. Of course, Plato has been criticized on the, on the, on the, on the, um, on the basis that Oh, he's, 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 he's postulating an hierarchical system of government, not an egalitarian one. That people's interest. Thank you for joining, uh, Philips. I want also Princess Adeombi Aboyeji. Thanks for joining. So that Plato has been criticized at different levels, but it does not take away uh, the reality or the, the, the this perspective to governance too. That see, other than just looking at numbers. Other than just looking at uh, majority, uh, other than just looking at, oh, it's about democracy and all that, that sometimes you need to look at issues around knowledge, issues around the quality of knowledge that leaders are made to have, the quality of training that people have to go through to be qualified to even become a leader. So we cannot totally say that, oh, because Plato, um, Plato, um, is proposing a system of government that is centralized and all that, we should throw away the baby and the bathwater. No, we should not lose hold of the fact that he emphasized the kind of quality that a leader or whoever is going to lead a state must go through and become before that person starts ruling. So that is all about Plato. I hope you've been able to get one or two points about that perspective about how a state should be organized, how a state uh, and, and, and the purpose of the state, according to that philosopher known as Plato. Now, the second philosopher or political idealist, like you may call him, um, this one has a level of influence and impact across board, beyond the level of state, politics, and all that. He, 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 he's done well for himself. Uh, he did well for himself in his lifetime until today. You would... If by the time I mention his name now, you know that, oh, this guy, um, you cannot but mention him when you talk about politics and the area of um, um, government. And that is Aristotle. Aristotle is the second. I told you I'm talking about just six of them today. Six. So, so just to lay the foundation upon which people, um, um, issues around state, evolution of state, the purposes of state, and the organization and all that. So the second person is Aristotle. And who is Aristotle? Fortunately for Aristotle, Aristotle also went to Plato's Academy. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Aristotle went to Plato's Academy uh, between the ages of 17 and uh, age 20. He spent about three years in Plato's Academy. He traveled widely and worked. Aristotle had strong exposure. Uh, you know why? Because he now went to, got to a point that Aristotle did a comprehensive study and documented 50, 158, 158 constitutions of different city-states. So, for example, Aristotle will go into, maybe let's assume that Lagos was a city-state in, in those times. Aristotle will go into Lagos, will go through their constitution, analyze it critically and document, uh, go to another state, do this and all that. So, Aristotle was coming in with a very rich, from a very rich background of comparative um, study. So he could, he could propose that this is what I've seen here, this is what, so by the time Aristotle was proposing his own um, idea of how a state should be organized, Aristotle said something like, oh, he, he was the one that propounded the organic conception of the state. That see, the state is the natural, when, you know when you say organic, he says, a state is a natural community and the highest of all communities, which embraces all the rest and aims at the highest good. And I, I, I like you to, uh, to, to emphasize that. Ajiboye, if you look at Ahmed Ismail, I can see you. Thanks for, for joining. So he say, Aristotle is emphasizing the fact that, see, the purpose of the state is the common good. Let's not lose that. And not just the common good now, is the highest common good. 
the highest common good. That, that, is, the, that is the point there. That, then secondly, it says that the state itself is, is like, um, is, is like when it, it, it's an organic formation, such that if something is coming from family to community to villages to clan and then to maybe bigger community and all that, that the state is like the highest formation through which man can could maximize their potential. Of course, you know that uh, uh, that's just the, uh, now that we have international relations, we have globalization, uh, we have a lot of um, exposure. Now we know that it's beyond um, that level. But let's not lose focus of what he was saying. He was just saying that, see, at different level we connect, but the highest level at the time was the state. And that because of this organic formation, man is able to realize his maximum potential in the state. So, like, Mon, Sonny, thanks for joining. So, that, that, that was where that concept came in. That Aristotle now said, man by nature is a political animal. I'm sure one of two of us have had this before now. Man by nature is a political animal. That was where the conception. But unlike Plato's um, emphasis on unity, Aristotle was able to advocate diversities. And that was why he came up with the idea of the uh, uh, plurality of the state. That the state has different elements, uh, different cultures, different opinions and all that. And these guys, uh, these elements come together to form the state. Now, but that is not the most beautiful thing about Aristotle's um, idea of the state. Uh, what is very special about Aristotle's idea of the state was his ability to establish, you know, I told you he did a, 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 a comparative analysis of about 158 constitutions and was able to come up with this. So he came up with a tripartite classifications of constitutions based on two categories. The number one category was the number of those in, which, in whom authority or sovereignty is resident. What do I mean by this? Aristotle is saying that, see, to analyze whichever country, whichever state, whichever system of government is either of these two levels. We will look at it from the number of the people that have the final authority on the state. For example, some government has one person as the final authority. Uh, that is what Aristotle called monarchy. Some government, uh, it is about a uh, few people that constitutes the government and the final authority of the state. Aristotle calls that uh, aristocracy. And the third level is a, a form of government that has many people, many people. Um, that are, I mean, not just few, different system of government. I mean, and that is what Aristotle called polity, polity. Uh, and now, so the second level of classification is about to whose good or to whose end are these people governing for. So, for example, he's saying that these people can either govern for the interest of all or for the interest of the people, for the common good, or they could govern for their own interest, the interest of the governing body. He said where this ex exists, what we have is that what we call a monarchy, that is, monarchy is a system of government where the ruler or the single person, you know, is a one person thing, is governing in the interest of the majority, in the interest of the people, common good, common good. But where that monarch is governing in the interest of his or his own personal interest, now he becomes a tyrant. And that was why he called the perverted form of monarchy tyranny. Monarchy or tyranny? Monarchy or tyranny? So you understand better now that when the government or whoever is a ruler under a monarchical system turns to focusing on his own interests other than governing for the interest of the people, then he becomes a tyrant. And that form of government is no more a monarchy. People could say it's a monarchy. It's now a tyranny. So that, that is that about that. It says... The second one, aristocracy, is where the few people in government are governing in the interest of the people, of the common good. Let's just say uh, in, the, in the interest of the common good. But where these people, these very few people, are governing in their own selfish personal interest, uh, then it becomes what? Oligarchy. It becomes an oligarchy. So that means the government of the few in the interest of the few. 
That is Oligaki. Adedayo Oni. Thanks for joining in, uh, sister. Th thanks a lot. Um, so, but the third level now is what is the polity. Now, that's where you will now get the under clearer understanding of democracy. Because some of us we've celebrated democracy as though it's the best and it's the best thing that has happened uh, to uh, politics and governance. But no, according to Aristotle. Uh, so polity is where majority of the people where you have representatives at different levels are the one governing um, the like we have it today where you have a lot of people um, elected or appointed into offices into positions at different levels and these guys are the ones governing in the interest of the common good. I'm sure you understand what I mean by common good now. In the interest of where they are governing in the interest of the common good, that is polity. But where, now, you know, it's majority ruling now. Where this majority are ruling or are governing in the interest of the majority, that is democracy. So democracy, according to Aristotle, is actually a perverted form of a more superior form. I don't know if you get the point. So democracy is where the majority are governing in the interest of the majority. That is democracy. Oh, you will say, oh, but well, well, the majority have to govern in the interest of the majority. That's why it's democracy now that uh, it's government of the majority and for the majority. But at a level, at a level, at a level, you need to understand that the majority are not usually correct at different levels. When the majority takes some decision, sometimes the minority, you know, sometimes um, you, you, you are in an association or a group and then you have to vote on a policy on a or a direction to go. And then you, you are just surprised that you feel that this one will have more lasting impact based on what you know and a few others. But the majority say, oh, this is the one because of maybe they are looking in terms of short term. And then decisions are taken. Does that make the decisions the best decision? No. But the majority have carried the day. So that's why we say the majority will have their way. The minority will have their say. So democracy in itself is a level of perversion according to Aristotle. And that is why uh, he was able to establish uh, those levels. So, I mean, let me also shock you with this information. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, um, Sanity. Thank you, um, Adel Sam, for joining. So, there's something I want to tell you about democracy. Do you know that the word democracy does not appear in the American Constitution? Not once. The United States of America that we call the citadel of democracy across the world. Do you know that if you search through the entire constitution from page one to the last, you will not find the word democracy or even its variant, you know, a variant like democratic, whatever, or um, democratization or whatever, you won't find one there. I mean, how come? And that is a, a whole constitution. And of course, in the Nigerian constitution, you'll find the word democracy more than once. At least I can guarantee you that. But you won't still find it. So, um, of course, America is a democracy, like we say, and all that. But that is to tell you that, see, even at the time the constitution was drafted and up till date, the, there is a level of understanding that is beyond the, um, what has been accepted about the word democracy. And that's why America will tell you that they are a republic not a democracy you i mean someone who understands the american system and the constitution properly will not tell you that oh it's democracy those democracy that are just being used now is because it's been socially accepted and all that but that's not the issue for today so that's that about aristotle i like us to move very fast because today we just want to go touch these six that's the second person now i'm going to the third person now i want we just want to touch these six perspectives about how a state should evolve how as, um, states are organized and the purpose and the processes of, of governance by this. Uh, we've talked about Plato. We've just finished talking about Aristotle. I move to the next person. And that one is a bit, um, uh, is a different perspective to the game. And uh, that is St. Thomas Aquinas. Also, the whole summary of um, the perspective of St. Thomas Aquinas is just about the fact that government is needed as an organ for looking after the common good, just like Aristotle. But 
The addition to um, Aquinas' perspective is that St. Thomas Aquinas is saying that, see, there is a level of government that is beyond humanity and that the divinity uh, influences humanity in terms of how states are organized. And what um, um, he was saying is that um, secular government should be subordinate to the divine government. It's talking about God. So he's looking at it from that perspective. And because um, secular government is just concerned about how society are, uh, is governed and all that, but the divine government is talking about something weightier that is talking about salvation of souls and all these things. So, and then St. Thomas Aquinas was also able to establish the fact that humans and government as, as 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 citizens we should submit to government because government are representatives of god on the earth and that is also a beautiful perspective to governance thank you so much ma thank you ma uh it thomas thanks for joining i, I can i can see you all so um so th that's the third one then the fourth one is niccolo machiavelli i like you to pay attention to niccolo machiavelli because like i said a lot of people have misconstrued the word Machiavelli, the end justified the means. Everybody just say, according to Machiavelli, the end justified the means and all that. But we do not really have clear understanding of why somebody will talk about a state, why somebody will talk about government in that perspective. So I'll give you a background to it. What Machiavelli said really, truly, is that you can actually use a moral principles, principles that are not moral, to establish yourself as a government. What Machiavelli is saying is that, see, a government can murder people. That, that's a, you, you will see that it's extreme, it's wicked. It's, a government can do fraud. A government can lie. A government can do even corruption to as long as the purpose for which the government is doing all these things is to ensure the safety and the security and the, uh, ensuring that the sovereignty of the state is intact, the government is allowed. Uh, and then, so you wonder what kind of uh, what kind of wicked perspective is this? But like I said from the beginning, you cannot totally remove the context of these people from what they are saying. Because at the time Machiavelli was saying this, now listen to this. At the time Machiavelli was saying this, Italy consisted of independent, disunited, and quarreling principalities. At that time, these principalities, when I say people are like territories now, um, in one government, so they, they are not, they are quarreling, they are disunited, it's like they are once against, and these guys are usually invaded by foreign powers, like Germany, like uh, France, like Spain, they invade them, and they take away their things, and all that. At the time Machiavelli was saying this, um, Italy was mocked, or even especially the Italian state, especially where Machiavelli is from, Florence, was mocked by so many city-states across the world. You know why? They perceive them as a people that do not have leadership, a people that do not cannot boast of their own army. Every state at that time had army, had a, um, a security network, but they did not have. So where he, he, there was a time he was in France on a, on a diplomatic mission and he had people talking about mocking the entire Italian government, mocking especially his Florence, where he came from, as a people that do not, cannot even boast of their own army. And something happened again when they were having a war, you know what they call mercenary, where Machiavelli came from, Florence had to employ a, a man known as Paolo Vitelli, a popular mercenary then, to fight on behalf of his own state or his own city state against a state known as Pisa. At the point of winning, they were almost winning that war, the guy withdrew because it wasn't, there was no loyalty, there was no pa uh, patriotism. The guy withdrew and that was how, at the end of the day, could not still win the battle. So they were in a state of disarray. And then Machiavelli came on board as a philosopher of his time to start writing what we could call guidelines. Guidelines to whoever was going to become the statesman at the time on how to govern that you need iron hand, you need force to ensure that this happens. You need something more than just being nice to bring the people together, to champion a common front, to save our city. Otherwise, we'll just be non-entity. His intention or desire was to return Florence and Italy 
to the ancient days of Great Rome, Roman Empire, and all that. So Machiavelli was proposing those kind of cruel ideas, but he did not fail to also distinguish between political morality and what? Private morality. So where issues around private morality are concerned, Machiavelli says, good to go. You can have, um, you can respect people, do what is needed, honor people, have morality and all that. But where it concerns uh, policies and uh, issues around safeguarding the interest of the state, go to any length. Um, if it means engaging in fraud, if it means doing all what have you and all that, Machiavelli approved this reality. And that is the issue where, of course, a lot of people just quote Machiavelli out of context and say, oh, it's about the end, justify the means. Whether the means is uh, do anything, no, at the end of the day, is the end that justifies the means and all that. So that is um, that about Machiavelli. I like to run just the last two. That's the fourth. I take two more and then we'll round off for this evening. Um, those two are, I'll call them the social contract theorists. I'll just take two out of them. And what is social contract theories? Um, the, he's just saying that at some point, unlike these other ones we've looked at, that the people actually came together to say that we cannot continue to live scattered like this. We need a government and we must consciously come together to have this government. And also, so that is social contract, a contract between the ruler and the root, a contract between the governed and the government, a contract among people to saying that this is how we want our uh, we want to be controlled we want to be ruled this is how we want to organize our state this is how we want to submit to authority we are giving you this contract on our behalf to help us maintain orderliness as a government and all that so that's the whole idea of social contract theories and one of the notable um social contract theories that is known is thomas Hobbes. some of us might have had the name thomas Hobbes before and all that and what was thomas Hobbes saying thomas Hobbes was advocating the idea of an absolute government that is the is the, is the solution to the raging social tumult thomas Hobbes um is an englishman and, and all that so at the time he was writing too, he was proposing a more absolute government. But this absolute government will not just evolve um, by any means except by the people themselves. And what was he saying? He says the state, uh, uh, like I said, every of them, were, they were writing based on their experiences at the time. And so they were writing within a contest. So what Thomas Hobbes was saying is simple, that life in the state of nature. State of nature is a state where everybody is a government to himself, where there is no government. Is That's why they call it state of nature. So you are living, somebody can decide to misbehave, to steal somebody's property. It's about how much power you have and all that. So it says state of nature, life was solitary on your own. Life was poor. Life was brutish. Life was nasty. Life was short. Because somebody can just take a gun now, I mean, if there was gun then anyway, and shoot somebody and take over his property. There's no government. There's no one to run to. There's no police, as it were. So how much you get, how much you get from the society is a result, is a result of your power, how much strength, how is a result of how much you can stand for yourself and for your family. And so that kind of experience or that kind of life could not continue. And what, that was what... And Tom, so Thomas Hobbes was saying that through a social contract entered by all, power is transferred to an absolute authority. That's the perspective of government too, that, okay, so he's talking about how states, how the state evolve as a result of social contract. He says through a social contract that is entered by all, power is now transferred to an absolute authority. Its central duty is to maintain peace and security. You could see now, because the state of nature, like I said, was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. There were a lot of things happening and all that. So there was a need for peace and security. So this was necessitated by fear. That the people came together and said, see, come, let's come together and let's all say, this set of people should take over leadership, but they should have absolute authority. Of course, the sovereignty should lie in the people, but you have handed it somehow, somehow to these few people. So whatever these few people decide, they are deciding on our behalf because we handed it over to them. So according to Thomas Hobbes, the sovereign is to be obeyed without complaint since he is not party to the contract but the product of it. So he is, you should just obey because he is just the product. And the last person 
the last idea, you know, we are talking about political, political philosophy today, political philosophers and their perspectives about evolution for those that just joined in, evolution, their perspective about organization and the purpose of the state. This government said, how do governments come up? What are the perspectives this way? And the last one um, that we we'll start talk about is another social contract theorist. His name is John Locke. In fact, John Locke is so beautiful that at some point, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a quote by Ebenstein. Ebenstein is, is another scholar that said that the text of the American Declaration of Independence is pure luck. He, I, I'm sure you will get what uh, what he said when I go into luck now. He said the text of the American Declaration of Independence was pure luck. And the main element of the American political system is pure luck. That's it's, it's, it's pure John Locke. That is, it was based on the ideas of how to organize the state as postulated by John Locke. And what is Locke's idea? Locke is saying that the state of nature, yes, is not as brutish, as wicked, as nasty, as propounded or as said by Thomas Hobbes. He's saying that the state of nature is moral and social in character, that human beings are not as wicked as uh, maybe um, pushed by the opinion of Thomas Hobbes, but that they are social beings. So there was already a moral, basic moral order, but that the issue, uh, uh, that, that, so the, the, the only issue he had with the state of nature is that life in itself, though satisfactory, that this peace that was being enjoyed could be constantly usurped. Constantly, there may be issues around um, corruption. There may be issues of degenerate men that just wants to disrupt the entire system. And nobody, there's nobody to run to. Yes, people live peaceably amongst themselves and all that. But when issues like insecurity props up, there's nowhere to run to. There's no one to. So, so what Locke is saying that the state of nature is further characterized by the lack of established known law. There's no justice system. There's no order through which um, uh, governance is being laid out and all that. So that that in itself is a risk, even though it's not as bad as was portrayed by Thomas Hobbes. So what John Locke was saying is that there is a contract of all with all. I say it again. There is a need for a con. There was a need for a contract of all, for all. So and that meant that all agreed to submit to the determination of the majority, and that's why we have democracy like we celebrated today. So that all will now come together to say that this is the set of people from local government to state government to national government. This is how we want government to be organized. So all will come together and submit to this set of representatives that government must be constitutional and based on the rule of law. Attention to that. Government must not just be constitutional, they should run it based on the rule of law. So the people themselves are the sovereign. The people themselves are the sovereign. And that's what Locke was saying. See, that at the end of the day, it is not about um, whether the, the, uh, the people, human beings are bad, whether human beings are power-seeking, competitive, and wicked. It is not about um, human beings being solitary, being nasty, nasty, and all that. It is first about the togetherness. The human beings by nature, they, they have this social character and all that, but there was a need for security. There was a need for, for, for control. There was a need for order in the society. There was a need to manage differences. And that was why Locke was saying that the people themselves came together. Thanks for joining in um, Tajuddin. Thanks for joining in Samson. Thanks for, for joining Kayode Abisogo. Thanks so much, sir. So, uh, what Locke was just saying in essence is, see, as beautiful as this order was, there was a need for a government of all by all. And that was when the majority came to, were, were handed over the power on behalf, pay attention to that, on behalf of the people. And Locke was careful to emphasize that, see, the power resides still with the people. That where they do not, if the government, for example, is not for the people's good, if the government exceeds its authority, such legitimacy can be overthrown by the people. So, of course, the system was put in place. And that was why, like I said, Ebbestens said that, see, the declaration of the American 
American Declaration of Independence is just pure love because it was on the basis of the ideas of John Locke that the Constitution itself was drafted and it was it was visible. And so, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a beautiful time this evening. Uh, we've looked at, don't forget how we started, for those that joined in in the course of the program, I'll, I'll just do like a summary again. Um, excuse me. I'll do like a summary again. Uh, what we've looked at today is... Um, the foundation upon which states evolved. The, uh, the, we've looked at the evolution, we've looked at the organization, we've looked at even the purpose of the state. Thanks for joining. Um, so we've looked at the purpose of the state, but we didn't just look at it generally. We looked at it based on perspectives of some authorities in that field. Um, people who have, over time, whose ideas still today have become relevant into, although social contexts have changed, um, um, realities have changed, but those ideas have become foundational guidelines to organizing states even up to today. And um, that's why we call them political philosophers. That's why some people call them idealists. Some, some people call them um, um, authorities in the field of politics and all that. And then um, what we've done is that we've looked at um, the, 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 their own perspective to these issues. And we've looked at uh, Thomas, uh, let's start from Plato. We've looked at his ideas where he advocated um, an absolute authority over the state that government should not just be thrown to people because they are many. He hated democracy and he had justification for it. And Plato was only saying that you needed a philosopher king to run the affairs of a state. And the philosopher king is not because he's a philosopher. Mm -mm. He was saying that you needed somebody who is sound, who has gone through a level of education that cuts across literature, music, um, military training, um, uh, uh, that cuts across different fields, engineering, mathematics, and all that. That these guys are dedicated for this purpose. They are trained and dedicated. Then the philosopher, before you could be a philosopher king, you will be among the class of a class called the rulers. And, all that. and these guys are not even allowed to own private property. So the, the issues around self and selfishness is already taken away by their training. And that was what Plato was saying. So we're able to establish that, that even though Plato's uh, opinion has been criticized, that he is, is advocating an hierarchical system of government, is not allowing for egalitarianism, which means equality and all that. It, it, you cannot totally throw away his idea that leaders or political authorities are not supposed to just be everybody and everybody. There are people who have gone through the level of training, a level of education, a level of equipping for the task of managing the affairs of the state. Secondly, we looked at, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, one day by day by, I can see you. Uh, so, um, Aristotle's perspective was different because he had broader perspective. Aristotle was able to study 158 different constitutions of different city-states. And that was a great edge. So he was a student of Plato, but he had broader opinion. He had broader perspective. And he, he, even though he also admitted that, see, we should be able to give leadership to people who deserve it, he was able to, based on his exposure, come up with different levels. He came up with categorization. Don't forget, I mentioned, Aristotle said that government can be ruled by, controlled by one person, few people, or many people. And then they can also be based on the interest of the people or the interest of the governed. Now, uh, sorry, of the people, the governing body. Now, what does that mean? Aristotle was saying that monarchy is a system of government where one person is ruling in the interest of the majority, not just the majority, in the common good of all. But where this one person is ruling in his own interest, at the expense of the people, it becomes tyranny. So tyranny is a perverted form of a system called monarchy. Secondly, where few people are ruling, and they are ruling in the interest of the common good, it is aristocracy. But where these few people are ruling in the interest of themselves, selfish interests of the few, then it becomes an oligarchy. 
Can you see? Then the third one is polity, where the majority are ruling in the interest of all. Now you will ask me, how can they rule in the interest of all? See, there are minorities where there are majorities. And because minorities, like we say in democracy, they just have their say. Polity is saying that you should pay attention to their own opinion and their needs too. There's a way to balance interest, aggregate and articulate interest such that at the end of the day, there will be proper authoritative allocation of values in the society. And that was what this guy was saying, Aristotle. But now, the democracy we celebrate today, like I said earlier, is actually a perverted form of government. And that was what Aristotle is saying, was saying that, see, where majority are ruling in the interest of majority, not paying attention to the interest of the minority and, and all that. Democracy is actually a system of government that just talks about the majority. So when, in, for example, a non-entity comes to say that you are the one, you will vote for me and all that, and the majority, seven out of ten, say, or six even out of four, say, we vote for this non-entity, and this sound guy who has solution, who has, who has exposure, experience, and everything, only for chosen automatically this, the other one takes over and rules on behalf of the majority. And that is it. And that's what Aristotle was saying, that democracy in itself is a perverted system and all that. But it's celebrated. And I said that, I, I gave an information that if you check the entire American constitution, because America, even though it's celebrated as the, the opium of democracy, if there's any word like that, there's no single word known as democracy in the entire American constitution. Of course, you have it in the Nigerian constitution, but you won't find the word democracy, or even it's very, maybe yeah, they just use the word as democratic. You won't find it. And you ask me, ah, why, why, why would America, it should even be the, uh, it's not about that. America pro, uh, is, uh, they, they will tell you it's a first a republic. This democracy is now socially accepted and over the years they've been using it to no doubt, but it's still not a word that is even qualified, despite all the amendments that have happened over um, uh, that have happened since the constitution. This is a, a constitution that is over 200 years old. There's still no one place where you will find the word democracy. Rashid Aziz, thanks for joining in. Um, Prof. Adeni Kadeni, thanks for joining in. So as we round up, um, that's about that. For um, Then we'll talk about St. Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas was only saying something simple, that government is... He, he, I said that Thomas Aquinas was looking at it from a broader perspective, beyond humanity. That government is supposed to be influenced and submitted to the authority of the divinity, that is God. That and um, people, he first stated that people should submit to the authority of government because they are, the government is a, a representative of the authority of God on the earth, number one. He's also saying that the, 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 the instrumentality of governance should be subjected to the uh, authority of God. That's the divinity. That government is not just um, an isolated entity that is connected to God and must get his inspiration, his philosophy, and where his interest contradicts the interest of God as laid down, then he should relegate his own interest to allow the divinity to take over. And that's one of Charles Saint Thomas Aquinas is uh, known, uh, amongst others, like Saint Augustine, they are known as church leaders' uh, perspective in politics. Then we looked also at the last two that we looked at were. Thomas Hobbes, who said the state of nature before states evolved, those were social contract theories. And we said social contract theories are just people who believe that people came together to have a contract. The ruler and the root, that this is how we want to be governed. We submit authority to you, and then these are the process, and, and, and that's good. But Thomas Hobbes, the difference between Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, which we looked at lastly, was that Thomas Hobbes was saying that the state of nature before government came to bear was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And that life was in a perpetual risky endeavor that people can just kill somebody, nobody was to order, nobody was to control, nobody was to be subjected to anything and all that. But that there was a need for government to come together to say, to, for the people to come together to say, we submit our authority, our sovereignty to this absolute authority to control things for us. And then, but John Locke, which uh, has been established to be the guy that uh, on whose ideas the American constitution was founded was only saying, see, human beings are not that wicked. 
there was already a social arrangement before government came to bear. But there was always issues around corruption, usurpation of power and all that. So the people had to have a contract with a few people to say, see, you guys, you would represent us. We submit our sovereignty. It's a willing submission. Um, and unlike colonialism and all those things that happen in Africa where people are compelled to enter into uh, a system that they were not even private to. So what Locke was saying is that, see, we give you authority over us. Where you exceed the rule of law that we have agreed together, we can throw you out. And that's why you could see that democracy, according to this perspective, has been trending and has been accepted globally by many countries, even African countries, even though, that's another subject for another day, even though, uh, I, I, I must recognize someone that is watching here now, uh, um, okay, Ola Inka, Ola Emi, thank you so much, I must recognize Kabiesi Mao Aladega, thank you for watching, sir, that is the king of my town i'm from agboike too and then and so and so i'm so proud that the the the, the kbs himself is watching thank you so much sir for joining so as, as i round up all we are looking at is that based on all these perspectives that have been established every society is peculiar every society must take note of the uniqueness of its people its culture to evolve a suitable system of government, to evolve a better approach that will solve its own problem. So what, I, what I'm saying in, a, in another sense is that, see, we cannot just borrow ideas. We cannot just say, this is how it is being done in this location. This is how it is being done in this location. We must understand our people. We must understand our uniqueness. For example, Nigeria. Nigeria is um, a country of beautiful but different ethnic cleavages. Societies who have their culture, who have their belief system, who have their peculiar history, who have their uniqueness. Everything about them is unique and all that. So you cannot legislate an authority that is universal and unilateral over all. So we must also as a people evolve not just a constitution, of course, constitution primarily, a constitution and a system that recognizes our uniqueness, our diversity, our authority, and also now provides for a unity that is accepted by all. Of course, that will be another issue for another day because the next time we'll be coming up, we'll be looking at a beautiful topic. We'll look at comparative federalism. When I say comparative federalism now, we'll be looking at how federalism, this different shades, because federalism has pattern, there is no one federalism. Uh, different shades and styles of federalism as practiced across some countries of the world, in Europe, in America, in Asia, and in Nigeria. So we'll look at specific countries. This is the shade of federalism based on their own reality. Now we'll now domesticate it into Nigeria to ask whether the shade and the color of our own federalism is actually what we should be practicing and how we can gravitate towards the right angle. That is what we'll be looking at the next time I come on board. Thank you for joining Akinde Solomon Adekunle. I thank you for joining in Saolai Wala Ogremi. For everyone that has joined in Damlola Oyele, I can see you. For everyone that has joined in, I want to say a big thank you because uh, when you join, it's also a level of encouragement that Nation Building Series with Femi Oyele is something we will continue to push together because the purpose is not to come and teach political science or anything. It's to share ideas on political education, to inspire you, to inspire you, to also start looking beyond politics as just something that some people do. Mm -mm. It's to inspire you to say that, see, with this little knowledge, drops of knowledge, I can also say that what next and how next can we ensure that we make things better than we've met it? And then we take a position, not just complaining and condemning and criticizing, but of also saying that how better, how better can we get things done? And we start taking our own responsibility and playing our own role. Thank you so much once again, Ive. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Yamiola Iwala. God bless you all. And have a beautiful new week as we proceed. God bless.